Okay, so I um, call this meeting to order. And pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of the Council on Aging is being conducted via remote participation. And as Angela said, it's also being recorded. So therefore, I suggest that you all mute your backgrounds, your um, sounds so that there are no background noises, dogs barking, phones ringing, and that sort of thing. And um, we'll proceed. This is a time for public comment. If anyone in the public would like to make a comment up to three minutes to express their views, please do so at this time. You can do so by raising the hand icon on the lower part of your screen, or if you are on the phone by not dialing star nine. Are there any public con comments at this time? I see one attendee um, with a hand up, and if you want to go ahead and speak. Go ahead. Hmm. Talking is permitted. Did you wish to make a comment, please? Angela, are you still there? I don't see any. Um... And I have another listener with a hand up. Please go ahead with your comment. This is Jacqueline. I was listening to you and somehow the call was dropped a few minutes ago. Okay, well, you are on now. So, um, I, I have no comment. I just want you to know that I'm, I'm with you in more than spirit. Okay, well, we appreciate that and we're with you too. So thanks for coming on and uh, let's, let's proceed. Any other comments from the public? Okay, let's move ahead with the agenda then. Um, we are very pleased to have with us today a guest. Um, she's not a guest maybe to many of you know her, but um, perhaps not everyone. Michelle Shimora is a social worker at the Senior Center. Um, let's see. She is also the outreach worker at the Emmer Senior Center. Uh, in addition to being a well-regarded and highly admired social worker, Michelle also has 20 years of experience as a certified SHINE counselor. SHINE stands for Serving Health Insurance Needs of Elders. And I don't think I need to tell you what a complex situation Shine Counseling can be with the myriad health insurance plans out there. So welcome, Michelle, and thank you for being with us. And please tell us about your work. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Um, so with Shine, we get extensive training. Um, it's about an 80 hour training course. And then monthly, we have um, additional training once a month um, for about uh, two, two and a half hours for each meeting to keep us up to date on Medicare changes. Um, since the pandemic, there's been a number of changes. The, they've made more, um, more services available online and you now can fax certain things. So there's more options uh, because the offices are closed. So in the past people, you know, if they were deciding to sign up, they would simply go to the social security office, spend better part of the day there, and um, then hopefully leave enrolled. 
But now um, things have really moved to online exclusively and sometimes mail and fax. So what we're seeing right now because of the pandemic is a lot of people who had intended on working till they're 70, um, you know, postponing their retirement have reconsidered. And what they're doing is um, making the switch to retirement. Um, and, and this is unplanned retirements, um, almost exclusively are the, the people who I'm getting calls from. Um, some are just turning 65 and some are well past 65. What we need to do is get them the correct forms. Um, so they, if they've been working and put off Medicare enrollment, we have to get them the correct forms so they can avoid the late enrollment penalties for Medicare Part D and B. Uh, those late enrollment costs can really be e expensive and they pile up very quickly. For every month you delay enrollment, you can get a penalty. But if you were working and had credible coverage, you avoid the penalty, the late enrollment penalty. Getting proof that you've had credible coverage can be a challenge. Um, so far, um, in the past few months, uh, everyone I've had hasn't had too much trouble getting verification from their employer that they've been working. But in the past, I've had people who uh, their company has gone out of business um, and they were not ever able to prove they had credible coverage, even though they did because the HR departments were gone. Um, so there's a lot of problems that can come up. So when someone calls and they've decided they're going to retire, we help them get um, enrolled in Part B as the first step. And then they have to choose between getting a Medicare supplement or a Medicare Advantage plan. And the, there's a big difference in cost between those two options. And there's quite a difference in what your um, the flexibility, I guess I would say. Uh, with the Medicare Advantage plans, you can only go to certain hospitals, certain doctors. Um, you're more limited in what your, your choices are. And for some people who are you know, newly retired on the younger side, free of any health problems, they're looking to save money. When you have people who have significant problems, I just had, um, someone who uh, was looking at the Part D drug plans and what a lot of people will do is say, well, my neighbor said this plan's really good and you should get this one. It doesn't work like that. Every person's situation is completely individual and I need to find the best plan for them through um, a computer program that Medicare has. Mm -hmm. um, one, a good example was one person I had, her medications would have been 1700 um, for the year uh, with one with the least expensive plan, had she taken her neighbor's advice and used her neighbor's plan, they would have been thirty thousand. Um, that's for somebody who's um, on a number of uh, medications for diabetes. So, um, you know, it, there's no doubt that Shine isn't a valuable service when you can save somebody potentially twenty eight thousand dollars. You feel like you're doing something really important. Um, so. You know, the first hurdle, like I said, we get them on Part B, then we figure out whether they want a Medicare Advantage or Medicare Supplement. If they're going to get a Medicare Supplement, then we have to look at the Part D options and see what we can do from there. And then we have the enrollment. And in part because I've been doing this so long, I know a lot of the pitfalls. Um, like, for example, one insurance company... Um, when you call to enroll, you know, and a lot of times you get that recording that says, this call may be recorded. They're not always recorded. And I found this out because someone I was with, um, this was before the pandemic, in my office, we enrolled her in, in a Medicare supplement. Um, right before her planned cancer surgery, so it was it was very important to get this in and done and timely. We did it all. We got the confirmation numbers which is extremely important. And we thought we were all set. Comes the day of her surgery, there's no coverage listed for her. Um, because I had that confirmation number, um, 
I was able to make sure she got the coverage reinstated. It was the fault of uh, the insurance company. They had not properly enrolled her. And, you know, and I was lucky enough to be able to advocate for her because when somebody's facing a surgery for cancer, I'm not going to tell them to call the insurance company. You know, that's, that's where I come in. I'm going to do that for them. That's what being an advocate is about. So um, the best part of that was, is um, I had also written down the name of the person we had done the enrollment with and uh, he called her and apologized. So that was, um, was sort of a bad situation that kind of turned around and worked out okay. So right now, um, like I said, um, I'm doing the shine work and two of our volunteers, Till and Marion, are also taking some clients. Um, I tend to take the Amherst people and the um, people from the outside towns I tend to give to, to Till and to Marion. Um, also, when people are hard of hearing, Till has a big booming voice. And so I will give those folks over to Till um, because he's a little louder than me. So um, that's what our service is. It's much harder to do it over the phone um, and by email. I am constantly emailing and calling people. And what would take me, you know, maybe an hour in the office is taking, you know, two, close to three hours over several days. Um, so just the amount of time and effort. And when you have somebody in the office, you hand them the sheet that shows their options. You point out physically, you know, the pros and cons of each option. A lot harder to do that over the phone. So, so that's kind of what, that's what's been really keeping me busy um, since all of this started back in March. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. It sounds to me, Michelle, like you have an incredibly vitally important job. And um, I'm sure that people are deeply indebted to you for all that work. So I would like to see if anyone has any further questions for Michelle. I think it's really you remarkable. You can raise your hand physically if you have a question. And then unmute yourself, of course. People come into the, uh, not into the office anymore, but uh, people make that initial call to us and they're so anxious. They're so scared and worried about making the wrong choice, getting mm -hmm. the enrollment late. Um, it's great to see the response where mm -hmm. I'm generally a pretty calm person anyways. And I can kind of just easily, gently get them into what they need to do and, and take all that fear and anxiety away. It's, it's, yeah. it's really good to see. It's really rewarding work. Yeah, Sue. I just want to say, <laughs> Michelle does a great job. She's really helped me through complex situations because my pension comes from Canada. And that's another whole scenario that she has to go through. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's really been a fantastic help. Oh, thank you, thanks, Sue. I've heard that from other people as well. Your your critically important work. I think I'm stunned at the length of time it takes you to work with people as compared to seeing them directly in the office over these um, health insurance issues. The right. complexity been... of the system is overwhelming. Anyway, I'm one of these single payer advocates so <laughs> go ahead please um i've been lucky in that most people i've been working with um have email access um uh, when they don't this is a whole different uh, ball game um and what i'm also seeing is it's not the lower wage earners that are choosing this early retirement or not even early retirement um it's the people who can really afford to stop working. So they, okay. they tend to have better technology at their hands, so. Yeah. And Michelle, would you mind sharing, um, because this is being recorded and will be shared, your direct, your phone number, and also slowly give out your email, or, sure. how, or how best you'd like people to contact you. And then also, if there's any particular documents that you 
uh, would suggest that when someone is seeking a consultation with you, that they uh, make sure that they have or have have readily at hand. I know that when we used to do the in-office appointments, you would you know discuss a, a bringing a list of prescriptions and why that might be important. So I don't know what would uh, any information that would help you in that initial conversation to to kind of prepare people for what they might need to know. Sure. My phone number um, in the office is 413-259-3038. Again, 413-259-3038. And my email is C as in cat, H, M as in Mary, U, R, A, M as in Mary, at Amherst, M A, dot gov. So it's my last name, C-H-M-U-R-A-M, for my first initial, at amherstma.gov. Um, when people are calling um, or emailing, it's very helpful for me to have a list of their prescription medications. And on top of the, the names of the medications, I need the dosage and the frequency. And with that, I'm able to enter that into the medicare.gov plan finder and the plan finder will sort out the, I don't know how many, we have over, I think it's maybe 25 or so Medicare Part D plans. So the computer fortunately will sort out what your best option is instead of having to do those manually. Hi, Pat. Unmute. Unmute, Pat. Unmute. <laughs> Pat, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Perfect, yes. okay, great. Okay, good. Are you, uh, Michelle, are you able to, are, do you have a backlog? Are you able to keep pace? You and, and your volunteers able to keep pace with the flow of people who are seeking your services? Right now, yes. Um, you know, if I take a week off and come back on a Monday, <laughs> it'd be a little overwhelming. Um, okay. But um, Till and Marion are, are really very helpful and um, can also pick up cases as need be. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Michelle, for, oh, go ahead. I just wanna say, if you have friends or uh, relatives or acquaintances who are thinking of retiring, um, the sooner they start the planning, the better. Mm. Um, I mostly get people who are maybe a month or two out from, from the date they want to stop working. But um, honestly, the, the sooner the better. The other thing we don't know yet is usually in the fall uh, is Medicare uh, Part D open enrollment where you can change your drug plan if you don't like it. And right now we don't know for sure if that's happening or not. So stay tuned. Okay. Okay. Well, Thanks for having me. That's good advice, and we definitely will keep that in mind because I remember taking calls at the desk when people would say, "I need them. I need an appointment for the shine because the deadline is coming up," and they would call a few days before they needed it. So, yeah, I hate that. that. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the okay. time. Okay, great. Good to see you. everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Good to see you too. Bye now. Okay, moving on, Michelle. Um, comments were very helpful. Mary Beth, you probably speak with Michelle more frequently and we do, so you're familiar with all of this. But I wonder if you can tell us what, if there are any updates on what's going on at the Senior Center right now. Mm -hmm. So since we last spoke, I think we're pretty much um, the same status quo. Uh, you know, I, I keep trying to disabuse people of the notion that we're closed. I get calls all the time. Uh, I think people are shocked when we answer the phone. 
and they say like, oh, I didn't think anyone would be there. I've heard you're closed. So I keep trying to frame it that we are open. We're just not allowing the public to enter at this point in time. Um, so to the extent that we can broadcast that we are open, we have always remained open um, because we do get calls about things like shine counseling and questions about Medicare or, uh, you know, how do I access lunch? Um, you know, or my mother needs additional assistance at home. You know, where would you recommend we go? So all of those kinds of questions were still here and ready and available to answer. And I just, to the extent that anyone watches this in the public, I think that that's a really important message. Um, I spoke with an individual who was writing an article statewide about senior centers yesterday, and, and we talked about that. And some, some senior centers are saying, the senior center is closed, but the Council on Aging is open. So mm -hmm. however, however someone wants to receive that word, just make sure, please, you know that we are open and we mm -hmm. are still functioning. We continue to serve lunch every day, and that includes our home delivered meals, as well as our grab and go lunches. And um, anybody who is any, um, a senior, which would be age 60 or above, who lives in Amherst, they can get a free lunch. All you have to do is call us at 259-3060. And we just take your name, your address, your date of birth, and we enroll you and you can get a great grab and go lunch. I keep telling people, um, you know, sign up as you will, because even if you don't want it for lunch, you could have it maybe later for dinner or even on a Saturday night if you don't want to cook. So we're still providing that meal service. Um, as I mentioned in our last meeting, the really unique piece of that grab and go is that we are serving far more people. There are a lot of folks who enjoy coming by. And then there's also the socialization aspect of, um, you know, coming and stopping by. We chat with you for a few minutes. You might see other people. We keep a uh, social distance. So we have painted, if you come to the bank center, we have footprints painted on uh, the sidewalk that tell you where to stand. And we have different colors for our drivers who are picking up our meals versus our folks who walk up or drive up um, in their car to do the grab and go. But and so we make sure that we're all safe in that adventure. We still uh, have available free masks. So um, we have folks coming even as recently as yesterday, continuing to come and pick up masks. So if an individual needs masks, um, please contact us. It's some people uh, were we're thinking that they were only eligible to get one mask. And when we initially handed out masks, we were pretty much following that pattern of one mask, but now people are coming back, obviously, and we're gonna be using masks long-term. So it's helpful to have more than one mask. As you wash one, you might be able to wear the other. So even if you've gotten one mask, if you'd like a second, please give us a call. Deborah Bridges and um, her daughter have been helping us in sewing them as well as a number of community members who have donated and continue to donate. And the town of Amherst also has them. So if folks um, find it more convenient to contact and call the town manager's office, you can also secure a free mask. So we wanna make sure that we're still keeping everybody safe and messaging around social distancing and wearing masks. That's a really critical piece of our work is making sure folks know how to stay safe and, and how to best support themselves. Um, as we pivot, and enter this virtual world. I, I, um, I think I have, I, I think of this in sports parlance as we're in a phase of settling the ball. So we had the initial sort of adrenaline rush of, and surge of responding to an immediate crisis. And now we know that we're gonna be in this state for a longer duration, um, both just within the town and people looking at what's happening with the pandemic internationally and nationally. And so this has been an opportunity to kind of um, reconfigure, pause, and decide how it is that we're going forward. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more in terms of whether we need to do a survey or not. But looking at how do we function as senior services uh, without a center that may be able to open um, for the near future. So how can we provide, oh, there goes our lights here. Uh, hold on, it's act, it's motion activated. There we go. Um, the um, how we can provide services in a way that's virtual and or uh, you know outdoors and in person. So um, one of the pieces I think when we talked about programming is 
I don't know if everybody understood that uh, m the vast majority of our programming was run and um, operated by volunteers. So if we were to look at classes, Yvette taught a class, um, Pat taught a class, um, you know, we had a number of volunteers. We have 179 volunteers at the senior center. That is what made us a rich and robust community. Um, folks who came and because they had rich backgrounds would share that uh, with with people who had like interests. And so um, we're just beginning to be able to recruit those individuals to return in some way to start teaching some of those classes. So I think that it's a, it's a slower process of building back up um, classes that would be available both online and other formats. And so, um, as you can well imagine, some folks are inclined to, and, and they're ready and eager, and they're busting out, and they're doing their classes online. Others are in that middle ground of, I need you to support me. So we're trying to talk to them about Zoom and how to work it and, and giving them some support. And then others are saying, like, that's not for me. Uh, you know, let somebody else deal with that. I, I, I'm an in-person person. So um, I think we're slowly beginning to, um, to have an opportunity to build up our classes. And each week I've been adding one. So for instance, this past week, I have, um, I, and many of you know that our Shakespeare class uh, is a beautiful community of individuals who have been meeting long-term for a very, very long time. And, um, their uh, leader and instructor um, didn't feel like it was something that they were able to pick up and didn't have an interest in participating in that way. So then I spoke to a number of the members and a number of the members um, got together, they met, and they're going to continue on um, and, and they have a date now selected and we're working with the technology. So, um, I guess it is to say that it's a slower process, but we're, we're doing the best we can with what we've got and looking at adding in some new things. So um, we're doing some conversations that will be around health, both physical health and mental health. And then we're also looking at doing some more socializing um, and putting together some opportunities for people to just try to get together in this virtual way. And lastly, with regard to the virtual way, we had discussed the last meeting about the digital divide. And um, I am hopeful that I will have a funding source identified in, within the next week or two that will be able to help us to um, close out that divide and purchase some lending library technology. So that's been a, a major priority because it, I can put on programming, but if folks don't have the opportunity to get hooked up online, it makes no difference. And so we wanna make sure that, that uh, everybody might have that opportunity. So we're running both of those tracks parallel of getting some technology and ramping up that. So I think that, that that's, um, yeah, that's about it for the update. You know, we are still, we are on site so that both of the social workers are here. Helen McMillan is here as well as Michelle. We're here every day. Our dining site manager, Donna Hancock is here and, you know, warmly greeting anybody. So if you need something, you can always come to the kitchen door and we'll see you, so. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a question about what, when you, if you do get funding for new um, computer and technology assistance, how will you connect people with that? I mean, people who need that probably need a lot of training to use it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how that would happen. Well, this is when this is when the MCOA is extremely helpful for me. So there are other uh, COAs that have piloted this already who have had and created some small lending libraries of technology. So there are policies and practices already in place for people who have tried this. So uh, for instance, there's a small town north of Boston and they found a funder, they purchased 20 uh, tablets and then the town IT department loaded on Zoom um, and set up those tablets so that literally it was just simply a handoff and you know, here's, how, here's the password to log on, here's the, the application, hit the Zoom, and you're, you're hooked up. 
So yeah. we do have our, our volunteers for technology still are with us. So um, and, and they have continued to help and support people. Um, it, it is amazing um, what, what they've been able to people. I will call them. I'll receive the call from a resident to say, I don't know how to do X, Y, or Z. Um, I'll call one of those individuals and, you know, he'll give me a call back and, he, and he's like, oh, I already know about this, Mary Beth. I can think of four things this could be and I can talk him through it. And literally within a half hour to 45 minutes, he's been able to resolve technology mm -hmm. over the phone. So that's certainly something that we want to be able to build up. Ideally, right, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do this all in person because that's how technology, I, I learned best that way, but we don't have that, that, uh, that uh, ability yet, but so we're, we're seeing what we can do to get some more technological support. Mm -hmm. but hopefully we're learning from what other people are trying and doing and, and coming together with best practices. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Pat, unmute. All right, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, um, yeah, just a quick question on masks. Um, I'm noticing um, that uh, while uh, you know, most seniors are pretty good at wearing masks, uh, a lot of people over time don't, don't cover only their mouths. And so it, they don't actually realize that, you know, it's really the pr optimal protection is the full nine yards, you know, mouth and nose. And so um, I don't know if, um, I think it would be worth it to explore, I don't know, in the newsletter or in, in the handing out process, just little reminders about the proper way of wearing it. Because sometimes they slip down, even something so simple as adjusting the ear loops makes a difference. And I think that supports good public health. And especially as the students return, um, it's gonna be important to be well protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Pat. I especially like the idea of having a graphic uh, in the newsletter. I had not thought about that. We are going to have a, a gerontologist do a piece about it. So we'll be able to do a video with about how to wear a mask. I will say even walking around downtown, I often see um, some of our seniors um, walking about. And yesterday I had one where the mask, I've got my mask here, and uh, they had the mask up here. <laughs> and so, so when I see people, I do correct them. So I was like, it, it does no good here uh, as a bandana. Um, you have to bring it down over the mouth, even if you're walking about. So um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it, we're all in training around that. And I think that, that that's very wise about we can't um, say it often enough. We can't just assume that, that that's going to, handing it's going to be good enough. We have to keep following up and following through. So I appreciate that. So hopefully we'll have two ways to communicate that. But I, I love the, um, I've seen some great graphics um, about wearing a mask. Like, don't wear it here, don't wear it here, you know. Yeah. So uh, I'll see if I can grab that and put it on. Thanks. Any other questions? I do see some hands up and I wonder if we have some comments from people. Yeah, so. um, are you interested in speaking? Oh, is this, hello? No, I guess not. Okay. Um, all right, Let's move on then. And I'm wondering if you have anything to say about the budget process, Mary Beth. Yes. So last week we did have the senior center had the opportunity to present our proposed budget to the town finance committee. And um, I guess a, a couple of highlights that I would share with you. And, and I hope you all do know, and as well as the public who might be watching this, that the town budget is available online at the town of Amherst, Massachusetts website. And our particular relevant pages are located on pages 95, 96, and 97 of the town budget. Um, the piece I think that probably would be most helpful for, for your uh, learning is you know, the proposed budget. Uh, personnel absorbs 99% of the budget. So our proposed budget is $222,364. And uh, that is a decrease in 1.9%. Uh, 
um, is the um, and and the um, the budget amount with regard to personnel covers the co the salaries for the director, uh, the program director, the administrator, and with a portion of the social worker. The social worker um, is also supported in terms of funding by the state formula grant. So $40,000 of the state formula grant helps to shore that salary. Um, and then with regard to the personnel costs for the senior health services nurse, that's covered through a private grant, uh, a, a gift um, that is given to the senior center annually. Um, and then the lunch site director is funded through Title III funding. We get uh, a um, small amount per meal that we serve and we use that to support the salary of that individual. So um, of the um, of the budget- Now you want me to? Pardon me? Someone, we, I think someone just accidentally spoke in there. Um, the, uh, with regard to the budget, so there's the, the $222,000 that covers uh, uh, personnel costs. And then the other fund amount is $2,775, which goes towards our operating expenses. So that's, uh, you know, it's not a particularly complicated um, funding prospect. The operating expenses, so if particularly those who are new members, um, it's divided between dues and subscriptions and then also training and supplies. So the breakdown of that approximate $2,700 is it costs us $1,300 a year to have my senior center, which is our information data management system. And then it's another approximate thousand dollars to be a member of the Massachusetts Council on Aging. So that's the statewide MCOA organization, um, which is uh, extremely beneficial and has been uh, critical really to our operations during the pandemic. So that leaves us about four hundred dollars for training and supplies. The training that that we formerly done is um, we fund one or two of us to go just for the day or, or um, two for the MCOA annual conference. That will be online this year. So there won't be, um, my lights went out again. There won't be um, any costs or, uh, unless we attend it virtually. And I'm not sure that we would this year. And then supplies, it's, it's paper and ink that we typically purchase. So it's a lean budget. Um, what I wanted to highlight was I shared with the finance committee the challenges that we face. The first challenge I think that, that um, I would bring to your attention as well is um, securing a revenue stream to support transportation. We do not have the ability to provide any transportation. The only transportation we formerly provided to older adults was a volunteer medical appointment ride. And I know Pat and others have been looking at this, so I won't, I won't go into that into too much more detail, but those volunteers and that program has been, have been suspended um, both out of safety on both, on both parts and occasions because to be um, providing uh, rides within a personal vehicle, I think, is a is a challenge in, in this uh, current uh, health crisis. So, um, you know, the only trading, uh, you know, I guess, uh, transportation option that we have at this point is a PVTA van, the senior van, both the ADA van and then the senior van. So that's, um, to me, uh, a priority. So we do have the bus. So we have the two vans that we use delivering food on a daily basis, but we do have that 22 passenger van with very low mileage. Um, and the, the unique feature about that, if we were to secure some funding for a driver would be that it, it's large enough that it would provide for that distance that's going to be critical to any transportation. So when I participated in the state um, reopening guidelines, we came up with separate guidelines for transportation services for senior centers. And it was really particularized to the use of those large vehicles that are 18 to 22 passengers. So you can maybe fit two to three people on there. 
um, because you have to have the six feet apart, six feet from the driver, and then six feet between each passenger. So, so it, it, is, it is quite limited, but at least the, the large size would facilitate that uh, capacity to be able to provide those. Um, most senior centers, I, I would just share with you, uh, based on my meetings with regional directors as well as statewide directors, are providing um, those van transportation rides just for medical appointments at this point in time because transportation is so limited by virtue of the need for social distancing in those uh, van transports. So I, I, you, you will see that some um, COAs are starting to implement their vans. Um, others have, have been have wanted to, but their drivers have left. So that was also another thing that was experienced statewide is many drivers were volunteers and some were paid. And because those individuals are in high risk categories and some of the, I think the, the earlier stories about bus drivers in, in urban settings um, coming down with COVID, many uh, uh, senior centers and COAs do have not been able to replace drivers. So even if they had the capacity and they had the revenue stream, securing a driver in this environment is also another huge barrier going forward um, because of the types of folks who typically take those positions. So just, just to share that with you. I also shared that um, another uh, challenge that we faced was our footprint and our lack of space. So presently, you know, we have the senior center which has been remodeled, but um, in terms of the use of the building going forward, the bank center and, and how that, that may be impacted, we're, we're, you know, we're uncertain. But I, I, the research around the importance of exercise and providing a facility for exercise in a gym would be ideal. And so that I just, that was one of the things that I posited is that it really was, uh, the two things I wanted to do was to have a social cafe um, and then to have an exercise space and a facility with some equipment because those two things are probably the best uh, preventative measures for dementia. From, and, that, and that's across the board from the Alzheimer's Association to gerontologists to say that the, if there's one thing that you should do, it is exercise. So, and then the, the last challenge was maintaining services um, given a climate of reduced donations. So the Friends, again, have been an incredible partner. They have shored the senior center. As I mentioned in the, the last um, meeting, they typically have contributed last year, I believe it was around $35,000. So everything that we do basically uh, beyond just paying for the salaries and, and um, some paper is supported by the friends. So a coffee stir, a donut, um, a program, paying for entertainment, paying teachers to do some programs or even outside guests and speakers, um, replacement of equipment. Um, so, um, that source of relying on the friends through donations, uh, if you were to look at it over the course of time, is, has um, that the donation base has reduced anywhere between six to $8,000 annually. And so the trend um, is, is not favorable for, for that. And also um, just trying to find some more secure, sustainable, funding I think is is a challenge and one of my challenges for, for me to secure. And then objectives going forward, the two uh, the, that I would just note is one was going to be for this past year was the census, participating in that and trying to, to get um, a fuller count. The census really matters for the formula grant. So the formula grant is the $48,000 that we get in addition to the contribution by the town. And the formula grant is the basic, basically the legislature determines an amount. So presently it's $12 and then they times it times the, the census. So right now our census count from 10 years ago was approximately 4,001 individuals within the town of Amherst. We know from our town census that's done that right now we have just over 5,000. So that federal census will determine our funding for the next 10 years, not only the count, you know, so, so that becomes a, a really relevant figure if we're going to, you know, hope, if not at least a thousand more 
I don't know where we'll stand on that. We have been calling people. We went through our My Senior Center database and each of my staff took a list of about 600 people. We've been calling people and participating in the whole townwide effort, but ours particularly targeted on um, older adults within the community. So, um, you know, looking forward as to the formula grant, we don't know what the, the level of funding will be. So it's $12 now. It perhaps could go down. Um, there are uh, different formulas or guesses by MCOA going down as low as $8 per person. So we, we could see a reduction in that 48,000. We, we won't know for a period of time. I certainly would report out to you uh, both, you know, what, what we learn. But um, so I think that that's, that's our full, um, I guess, yeah. the way in which I presented our, yeah. Tim has a question. Yeah. Tim? Mary Beth. Um, how remind me how the uh, friends receive the funds today because uh, we actually i made a donation about a month or two ago and our check the check has not been cashed mm -hmm. so oh so i just want to know what the lag and delay is and how that works yeah so so i would share that so the friends are a, a group of individuals they are not professional or paid fundraisers and they formerly were working here and they would be here on a weekly basis and on, on sometimes often a daily basis to help us uh, they would pick up the checks they would deposit it but with the, um, the banning of entry of the public we have been working to develop new ways to get the information so formally if you mailed the check it came here to the senior center um, and so we have been making up packages and delivering them at intervals to the friends mm. for for deposit and to go through and i will and i will just you know i would like to suggest also that it's been challenging can anybody hear me yeah uh, hi oh hi this is barbara slovin yeah barbara tim you... i don't oh, i don't know can you hear me tim oh yes barbara yes we can hear you okay Oh, good. Uh, I have to check it. All our checks have been deposited. So I have to figure out why I don't have yours deposited. Um, I, well, I can all my letters have not been sent out. So a whole grouping had been, but in the recent months, uh, month, I don't think I've sent out any letters of thanks. Um, but everything has been, I did take pictures of all the checks that I deposited. So I'll, um, well, I'll I can, see I can check my, uh, uh, records and, and I've got your, let's see, I've, on the list, I've got your email. I can let you know the check number uh, or the date and so on. Um, my recollection is I put it in the envelope, uh, the, uh, mail or envelope and send it off. Yeah. Well, what, so. one thing that, that I would just also let you know is that they've just, in the last two weeks, so um, the, uh, the person who assists them as a, the treasurer, Mary Elmer, uh, was able to purchase a PO box and also uh, filed a mail forwarding. So I know that there is some delay. So sometimes I am still getting some of the mail here at the senior center okay. and other times I think it is landing in the PO box. So okay. I, I think I that, already, uh, yeah, that's one of our things. So we do have a PO mm -hmm. box um, that I picked up just a couple of days ago and um, there wasn't a check from you, Tim. That, I mean, there wasn't an env any census envelope. Okay, I'll check, so I'll, I'll, I will check, I frankly, I don't recall exactly how I sent it. I think I sent it in the envelope, but I can check it. And let you know. It's whatever, it will, you know, okay. usually every, no every problem. check that I, as of this week. Okay. That I've received. And I think one of the things is we have to start letting people know that we have a post office box. Um, and it's post office box 933. But Nine three three. Yeah, and it's okay. in town. It's the town one, and 
right now. I cannot. Uh, I, know, actually, I do know. I do know it's uh, 01004 yes. dash 0933. That's the uh, zip code. Okay. Yep. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, did uh, Jacqueline, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Okay. I have one question, Mary Beth, um, mm -hmm. on the formula grant. How is that money distributed? How much of that goes to salary or? All I, of it. All of it goes to all salary. All of it. So it, it, supports the, uh, it supports the nurse and also the social worker. It's all, oh, okay. All. So okay. the funds from the town as well as the funds that are secured for, um, my lights went off, there we go. Uh, for the formula grant go towards salaries. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Okay, um, one of the things on the agenda we wondered about is how the board can best support you during this pandemic. And um, since we're not on site or near the senior center, what can we do behind the scenes? And at one point you mentioned something about a survey and I uh, wonder if you could elaborate more on what you meant by that. Yeah. So um, I, I think that this opportunity and time is a great opportunity to, to reimagine and reinvent uh, what we do in terms of services and, and how we deliver services, what type of services we deliver, programs, how we touch people's lives. And I think that we can, I can make a guess based on calls, based on interactions, but I was very curious. I think that the, um, when I looked at the budget and, and what I had written back in January about objectives and where we were going and, and all of my plans, it's like the, the slate got cleared um, with COVID. And, and I feel like there are, there are different and more pressing concerns. And I don't uh, anticipate that those were quickly resolved, that, that we, this is not a race to be opening a senior center. I think each senior center is looking at a variety of factors from footprint to to um, you know, how risk averse they are and making decisions about opening. So given the fact that we are not opening till at least looking at January, and again, who knows what that might bring. Um, I know that we had discussed probably about six months ago, the, the question of the survey. And that was also on um, the budget report because the annual survey, the 10 year, survey was due and we had decided to defer it till we kind of had a focus for it. And I didn't know whether there might be some form of survey. Um, it, it doesn't have to be the, the huge undertaking that occurred about 10 years ago was um, a very expensive endeavor. It cost about $10,000. I think that the information that was gleaned um, was, was um, limited. Um, and, and what I mean by that is uh, it, it was only done through mailing. And so they mailed 1,800 cards out. They got back. It was an N of, I think, 735. So 735 responses. And I think that, that the, the individuals who participated, if we were to look at the demographic and socioeconomic characteristics of the responders, it was a, a very slim slice of individuals. So for instance, I think it was like 67% said they had uh, postgraduate education. So we know that that may not necessarily be um, the most uh, transparent um, slice of, of what is needed and, and what we should be doing. So um, I just wanted to offer uh, if there was some, I know uh, Pat and her group had talked about doing some listening groups or in, in, um, trying to get a sense of really what the future direction should be and can be, and also the types of programming that 
that people are looking for. Um, but where we tend to, to I think, um, best serve people um, is around, I, I think of it as Maslow's hierarchy of need. Um, and maybe that's just been because of this particular crisis, but making sure, first of all, people had food, they had groceries, they have health insurance. So we have, I think, um, sort of operated in that lane. And then volunteers filled in the other pieces around culture and socializing and exercise and things of that nature. But I didn't know, um, you know, I, 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 I have, if the guesses that sort of we're making and the people we, we land on are, are meeting the needs. So, so I, you know, I always think it should be a conversation around developing programming and um, that's harder. It's just made harder because I can't, other than speaking to you all in this format and people calling me on the phone, um, it's been a bit of a challenge. So um, I think that, that I would like to partner more with the community to find out what can I do for you, you know, um, beyond the critical need of support and safety and security within the community. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty stable there, but what more? I know you ask that question of people all the time when you encounter them, which is vitally important. What kinds of answers do you get? Um, yeah, what, what kinds of answers I get? I don't often get a lot of answers. What, what I would say is that it's sometimes challenging for people to speak need. Um, and I think what I look for more are patterns. So I would share with you that um, I, Barbara called me last Friday night. She's like, do you ever go home? And, and I said, no, I stay late on Friday nights. You know why? Because I notice a pattern that around 3, 30, 4 o'clock, people will start phoning me. Um, and, and they might start with an innocuous question or they might just call and say, Mary Beth, I'm just wondering how you're doing. And, and what it speaks to is loneliness and isolation. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, I, mm -hmm. I need, you know we, we need to provide more platforms and opportunities for just that, you know, just connection in some way. And I know that, that Zoom will be able to offer a piece of that. Um, you know, in the, in the next round of programming, we're going to be, you know, facilitating some, you know, just dial in like a, you know, people, some people call it a happy hour. Some people call it a chat, you know, hour or something. Um, I had been reading um, Ross Gay's book of delights. And so I, I, I had been thinking that I was going to call it a delight hour and come and share something delightful. What delighted you today? Um, so that's one piece of it. Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea, but um, I know that there's more and, and I don't want to just promulgate it. So I, I am looking for some way. Um, and, and when I put it, we put it in the newsletter, you know, call us and let us know what you want. Very few people do. And, and I just know that yeah. my own reflexive response, when I have been in need, I, I rarely voice it. I, I, there's a whole lot of cultural issues around that, or maybe it's my family of origin. I don't know, but it, I'm just saying, I, you know, I'm trying to think of ways to, to elicit what's happening at that, that level. I, I have a good sense of our immediate area with, with Clark House and the Housing Authority because I am there every day and I'm in and out of the building and I see people, but that's just one swath. Um, so. Mary Beth? Yeah. Go ahead, Jacqueline. I, I, I wasn't sure whether I was still tuned in here. I'm still getting familiar with technology and the intricacies. I think it's a very good idea. Um, one of the things I found just uh, doing informally, contacting some of the elderly African American people that I know, and it has, personally, it has been such a delight for them. So the, the, the name you're thinking of, I think is a, is a great one. Um, it's as if when I call, it's as if I've 
I've given them a piece of a gold mine, just a few moments of conversation, which end up being much longer. I think it's much needed. I think that that um, the survey and the calling go together so beautifully because that's the other part of it. What else would you like to see? What would you like to have in the community where you live, move, and have your being? And I think people will be, I think they'll be open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And I don't think they're, they're going, like, like you're saying, I don't think they're going to come and ask for it. Right. But if they are invited to share input, there's a greater likelihood of getting the input from them. That's why I need all of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To help yeah. me with this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's, my, that's right down my alley, as they would say. Thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> um, Pat, unmute, please. I should unmute. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I want to support uh, um, the, both Mary Beth and Jacqueline's comments about loneliness. Um, and, um, you know, it's not anything that, it's not a word we used in our draft of our mission statement, but my experience of, of, of uh, volunteering at the senior center over the past um, year and a half or so uh, had told me that 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 really is one of the major functions um, that that we uh, had undertaken and it made an enormous difference and it crossed um, uh, class and race and um, economic uh, economic uh, uh, barriers because uh, anyone can be lonely and um, and so that was, I think, part of our strength. Um, so, um, you know, I think that there are probably a variety of ways that I can think of. One thing that struck me when I was sitting at the front desk was that we have all these emails and uh, a large portion of our, um, of our uh, the population who participates uh, doesn't pick up everyone, of course, and that's a problem, but um, that there are ways of connecting, perhaps even, um, I, I would like to th think of if some kind of a, um, whether we could make a, make a more robust use of email. Um, just even, almost, I perhaps it's too ambitious to think of, of daily emails, but it's a connection like a thought of the day or a resource uh, note or something like that, that builds, builds that relationship and connection during this time. Um, it um, and increases this, the visibility of the center. So that's one thing. The other thing I was thinking of is we should all probably, all of us on the council should uh, should feel deputized <laughs> to be, be asking our friends in the context that we have at a safe distance, but in, you know, as we connect, um, that part of our, our conversation can be, what, what's, what's up for you right now in terms of, of how are you managing? And, uh, you know, what have you learned from this experience? And so I think that so that's that's kind of that sense of empowering us to be doing what uh, both Mary Beth and and Jacqueline uh, are doing. Just you know, asking the question uh, is is I think in a, you know that's we should go forward with that zestfully. Um, and I guess the other thing is it occurs to me with respect to programming, which Mary Beth touched upon earlier. Um, you know, I'm, I am wondering, it, it, the, the Zooming is, um, you know, we all have a bit mixed feelings. It's, there's nothing like the real thing of direct connection, but um, there are some, I think, think some opportunities to do some, to, to think about creating some programming um, 
via Zoom that perhaps could fill some holes. And um, I guess one of the things that has stopped me and perhaps others just around economic lines is that is there whether is the what is it is something like a $14 monthly fee for an individual to become to host a zoom session I looked into it briefly but um, no okay so maybe that's the kind of thing I mean there you know that we could we could think about some zoom programming and I think that's already going on but what are the what are the holes in in information and um, I, I just want to add one more thing around that programming thing is that and and this is a different kind of survey maybe even like a zoom survey but the Canadians have developed this uh, what they call focused conversations and what that is is maybe they would take a topic uh, and maybe the topic is resilience or how are you getting uh, what are your ideas? What, what has helped you get through this time? And so we do a, Z a Zoom meeting. We, we email as many people as we can or connect. Um, and, and then, and, and then we, we Zoom away. We, so that we're, we're uh, providing we, um, you know, an opportunity for people to um, say, you know, uh, what they you know that uh, what and how they're doing but it's it's focused conversation is that it is lightly moderated so that you know people uh, speak briefly and pointedly to what they're doing but it still offers some connection and ideas and um so i um I think that there are some opportunities in that. Those are good ideas. And let me remind everyone that Mary Beth has set up a program with UMass and um, Bruna? Brun, mm -hmm. Yep, Bruna Martin. That, that, mm -hmm. that involves a lot of just what you said, talking about what it's what it is it like for individuals to be going through what they're going through right now, their feelings, their thoughts, their emotions. And she's extremely supportive and anyone can join that program. Mm -hmm. So look for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Tim. Yeah, uh, Mary Beth, you might do this already. The other thought I had was either speak with or, or survey town employees. Uh, mm -hmm. see what they uh, observe, whether it's the person in taking an elderly individual who comes in to pay their bill or the fireman or the police officer who might observe something mm -hmm. and develop uh, potential uh, holes in our programs or additional needs and so forth. So as I say, you might do that already, but that would be the other thought. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. That I used to get a bit of that when we did our SALT meetings, which is the, the seniors and law enforcement together. So we would be with fire and police once a month and sort of talking about, you know, what's happening. But of course, that, that closed down in March and we haven't met since then. So that is a gap of information, Tim. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the other thought is, uh, uh, contacting uh, tradespeople in town uh, when plumbers go into people's homes or electricians and they might spot things that uh, they've never mentioned to anyone and if they mention something to you or the senior center that's another possibility to come up with some ideas great Thanks. Yep. okay anything else on that topic okay thank you Okay, and um, I had asked you, next on the agenda is uh, the mission statement. I had asked you all to review it and, and provide your comments, um, how the readability is, if we cover everything. The ad hoc committee uh, got together several times and um, we, mulled over quite a bit of information and tried to put com together something that covered um, a lot. So what are your thoughts and where do we go from here? 
any comments or um, things that you felt needed changing? How did it read? Was it understandable? Was it clear? Um, did we miss something? Let me just re read it over. The Amherst Massachusetts Council on Aging serves supports and partners with older residents from populations that are diverse in many ways, including ACE, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, gender identity, ability, and economic circumstances. We seek to assist older adults in remaining as independent as possible and maintaining their total well-being and dignity. We further seek to advocate for and offer access to programs and resources that assist them and those they, who support them in optimizing their quality of life, socially, mentally, physically, culturally, spiritually, and economically. We explore ways to co-create new programming or adapt existing programming in ways that better serve seniors' evolving needs and foster self-fulfillment and community engagement. We seek to create activities and practices in all our gatherings that enable and embolden older adults individually and community-wide to take part in decision-making, program development, service, and advocacy that meets their needs. We endeavor to educate, advocate, educate, collaborate, and build coalitions within the larger community on the behalf of older adults. Sue. Uh, I just want to comment that I appreciated that last paragraph. That was new. And I'm glad you put that in about uh, going into the community so that the whole community somehow takes a little more ownership of being part of the senior center. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else? I know at one time, um, last time, Tim, you mentioned that we didn't include naming the senior center itself as a site. I think that this pretty much encompasses or it doesn't matter where we do our programming, be it at a specific place or what have you. So are you okay with that, Tim? If, okay. You want to unmute? Okay, go ahead. Are you calling on Tim? Okay, Tim. Unmute. Ah, can't unmute, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Is it working? Tim, can you speak now? No. Huh, I guess it's uh, anything else. I think Tim may have lost signal. Pat. Yes, I, I just want to just share with everyone that Jacqueline and um, Rosemary and I worked on this and I just wanted to just lift up that you know, part of what we were, what the original mission was, uh, was very service oriented. And those services, of course, are critically important. Um, but we also wanted to kind of inject into our mission statement, um, both um, um, more actively co-creating programs that seniors ourselves uh, can be involved in, uh, you know, identifying needs and co-creating with uh, Mary Beth and the rest of, her st of the staff, um, those things that, uh, that uh, we, we um, 
that that meet the needs that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so that was part of it. And I think also that just the notion of community engagement um, and building skills, um, I want to say skills, um, and, and it's, I, I want to just name creating a, a, a spirit of beloved community with the center. We are, we are, we have a, all, each of us have abundance of, in years, uh, but we are still learning and we're learning to be with each other uh, with more uh, every day. And so that if that can be supported in the way, in, in the way we learn and as we build relationships with other, other folks um, and, um, with, and do that with greater intention and kindness and all those things, um, particularly important as we connect with uh, and learn uh, from uh, uh, those of other language communities, other uh, racial experiences, uh, other um, uh, you know walks of life. Um, it all, as we hang out together, no matter whether we're playing cribbage or we're exercising and sweating together or whatever it is we're doing, um, we, that was, I guess that was the intention of, yeah. of the, of our mission statement. And so that's what we tried to weave into it. And uh, it's a living document and <laughs> uh, it will change over time as our needs change. But that's, that's the background. And I would welcome either you or Jacqueline, the two or both of you to add to that. But that I think that kind of, that's what we were blending, trying mm -hmm. to blend. Yeah. And welcome back, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, technology. My computer decided to provide updates and restart just during the... <laughs> so, I mean, I couldn't figure that one out. Uh, anyway, I'm back. Um, yeah. The only uh, small change I might suggest is right at the beginning, and rather than the Amherst uh, Council of Massachusetts, say the town of Amherst, a uh, small little point, but there, uh -huh. uh, being an Amherst College uh, person, uh, sometimes when I see the word Amherst, I think of the college, uh -huh. not necessarily the town. So just a minor uh, as a possibility um, yeah. for that. Um, or put it in the title, the town of Amherst Council of Aging, and then start the, the body saying the Council of Aging, blah, 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 just so it defines it a tad better. Yeah, that that's interesting. I think the title, the town of Amherst Council on Aging, might be a wise. That might be the more appropriate thing. way, because yeah. otherwise, it's a it's a long word full of introductory words just yes. to start the mission statement. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably. How do you feel about that, Pat and ja Jacqueline? Yeah, Pat, unmute. It's good. I like it. Okay. okay. All right. Any other comments? Um, I'm wondering if we should adopt this, um, take a vote on uh, whoop, what happened. I have one, uh, sorry, I have one other small comment. When this is finalized, would there be a date put on the document. Right now, there is no date in the draft. But when it's finalized, it's always good to have a date, uh, not necessarily a specific day, like you could put September 2021 or something like that, somewhere in the document, either at the yeah. top or the bottom, just so uh, when yeah. one reviews the statement, you understand when it was last done. Yeah, I think putting that at the bottom would be a, a good thing. Yep. Uh, okay. That, that's a good idea. Do people feel ready to um, vote on this? Or Greg, you had a comment. More of a question than a comment. Um, when the council was created, and I know that there's councils all over the state, you know, different communities, but is there a act or some sort of uh, some sort of document creating the council? Okay. Uh, yes, there is. And that has a mission statement or authorizes the council to do certain things like advocate 
as opposed to other activities? Uh, that and, should be in the manual yeah. that I gave you, um, right. Craig, um, when the Council on Aging was established. And uh, yeah, I would I just think one that was older, but I guess my question is does the two fit together well? Because uh, I, I think the authority uh, of the council comes from the original document. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm assuming we have the authority to make changes. Um, I just want to make sure. Uh -huh. Well, that's a good legal question. <laughs> Pat. Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, um, and I appreciate that question because when I was thinking about this, I looked up the bylaws, which uh, were created a while ago, and I wanted to make sure that um, the spirit of the, that original um, creation of the bylaws, which is, has legal underpinning, I guess, um, is something that we paid attention to. Um, so, um, and and I, one of the things I especially appreciated uh, is that the council was um, uh, formed largely, I mean, a core mission right on the top of the list is advocacy, advocacy for uh, seniors. And um, so um, that's, I think, uh, I think what, I, the way I thought about this was to that what this statement does, this mission statement does is put a little bit of more meat on those bones, uh, just really for uh, to guide us in in the way we work together and uh, you know um, um, define it really to show some a little more about what our values are. Mm -hmm. um, and our intention is, uh, I think that's, that's the, uh, that's, that's what we were thinking as we were rewriting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mary Beth, do you have anything to say about the legal aspect of making such a change? How come you're muted? <laughs> I, because I was shuffling paper, so I muted oh. But Greg and I do think alike because I did, I, I, without interfering, I had the same question on my mind in the back of my mind around mission statements fitting. There's, there is enabling legislation, Greg, um, and I believe, I, you know, I was looking at it, it was like chap chapter 40, I think section 8B. So that's uh, basically what, what authorizes the establishment of a council on aging. There have been um, two different drafts of bylaws. So there was an initial group of bylaws um, that were created in 1967 and then the bylaws by which you now guide yourselves. So I think that if, if you should, if you were interested to see how those dovetail, that you know, certainly would be uh, you know, worth, your, worth your inspection or review. Um, what, um, because I, I, I was intrigued by the fact that there had been no mission statement. So there is an articulation in the bylaws of purpose. And that's what I think what Pat was referring to. And it does, there, there are like four enumerated purposes within the present bylaws. And I think that the, the drafting of the, the present, um, mission and how, um, how Pat describes it as, as sort of giving more color and um, uh, I think more definition to, it says like to, to advocate, but I think the, the way in which this body sees themselves advocating and the priorities I think um, are, are further I, 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 I enhanced through the mission statement. But if you wanted to look at it, I also, I can, you know, I can, uh, scan and email you all these documents if you want to just look at where you stand historically um, and how this would fit in within your authority. There's nothing in there that I saw that that prevented a mission statement or that um, in any way indicated that that what you're looking to do, which is set out the values by which you are carrying out the mission and also the purpose. Um, I, I didn't see anything at odds or 
you know, in contravention of it or anything that said particularly that you couldn't do that. So uh -huh. um, that's, that's what I saw. And I'm, and I'm happy to share the documents that I had located about it and the, the sort of statutory references. But as Rosemary indicated, it is in the, I think most of them are in the binder, uh, but I went through the old um, files of the COA um, around the governing documents to just uh -huh. double check if there was anything else. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I don't remember, you know, the only, it isn't labeled as a mission statement, but the only thing that we've had so far is just um, the main purpose of the um, Council on Aging, which isn't really a mission statement to, no. per se. So yes. why could we not just simply adopt such a new thing? Mm -hmm. uh, we're not changing anything. Yeah. Yeah, so just for the, uh, it's in article two of your bylaws, it says the purpose is, it says the COA is primarily advisory. Its basic purposes are one, A, to identify and advocate for the needs of the aging population, which is further enhanced with the mission statement. B, to educate and enlist the support and participation of all Amherst citizens to meet the needs of elders. C, to recommend and evaluate programs and services to meet these needs. And D, to cooperate with the Massachusetts Executive Office of Elder Affairs and Highland Valley Elder Services, our area agency on aging, and to be cognizant of state and federal legislation in programs regarding elders. So that's the, the only purpose that's listed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Let me get my manual. Let's see here. And the only other thing that the only other thing that we had was the first page of the manual, the principal goal of the Amherst Council on Aging, um, to run a multi-purpose senior center. I think you know that's, and which serves as community focal point for the provision of services for the elderly. The council works to initiate, facilitate, coordinate, and provide these services which in the broadest sense enhance dignity, support independence, maintain health, and promote the involvement of Amherst's elderly in the general community. So that is a principal goal. It's not really a mission statement. So I, as I see it, we never had a mission statement. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to adopt one. Should we... Um, I, I don't have any problems. Able guess for now. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I don't have any problems with the mission statement. It's just, I, I did see the binder, but there's little pieces in different places. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, I think Mary Beth just read something that said, I think the bylaws, uh, that the primary uh, purpose is to advocate, advocacy or something like that. Uh, since that's the primary, what is the other purposes that's not considered uh, being an advocate? I mean, uh -huh. the functional purposes they're talking about, because it said primary, it didn't say the only purpose. Uh -huh. uh, it's just not clear to me what, what some of the stuff is. I, and I, I think that may be the same for other people. That's why we're doing the mission statement, because uh, we haven't made it clear. Uh, and I just was wondering if anybody looked at the other stuff. Uh -huh. It was more of a question than anything. Yeah. Like, I have no problem with the mission statement. I just want to make sure everything fits together. Uh -huh. Because I, I think what I'm doing is looking down the road to a point where we know what we're going to be doing, goals, uh, purposes, you know, there should be goals, activities that we're working towards, uh, you know, if one of the purposes or if the primary purpose, as opposed to the other things, is to have a, what is it, what is it? the statement was a multi-service? Multi, yeah. yeah. Multi, so, um, that's so what do we do each year to try to reach that goal? Okay, do we have a plan? Has that existed? I'm just trying to get information to figure out, you know, uh, where to turn my attention to and what we'll be doing uh, in the upcoming year. You know, there's always activities that you have to maintain because they're very important. And we know what some of those are and some of the programs are. But there may be other things that we should look at doing because of uh, a primary purpose or our goal. 
if our primary focus is the center, do we do an evaluation of the center every so many years to make sure we're meeting the need uh, in terms of, is that a facility type thing? Or are they talking about something else when they say, uh, you know, multi-purpose center? Uh, yeah. So uh, that's just questions that I have. I don't have, I don't think uh, in discussion today, uh, I agree with most of that, most of it. Um, I just had that question. Well, I think we, in? yeah, I think we want the scope to be much broader than just the senior center. We want it to be more inclusive of any services within the community, really, that we can provide for older adults and with older adults. So um, I don't like to focus only on the senior center itself, but all of the services that can provide, be provided for older adults in the community. Yeah, I understand. Okay, we can table this for now. And um, did you have something to say, Jacqueline? Jacqueline's phone keeps lighting up, so I don't know if she wants to make a comment yeah, or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I appreciate all of the comments, and I want to, I guess, begin just uh, a response um, that was building up inside of me. The, the senior center is more than a building, in my opinion. Um, it is a center of community or for community. Um, I think in looking and recalling the, the earlier statement that was uh, citing the mission, there, there were some things that were not taken into consideration necessarily or were taken for granted. And the senior center and our mission statement is just as reflective of a changing society mm -hmm. and our needing to meet the needs of, a, of the present age and the way in which you're right in terms of the future, looking at the future. I think it's important to, to, to lay the foundation for what will be forthcoming while maintaining our allegiance to the letter of the law or the statute. And, and so I think we enter into this with that in mind. Um, sometimes when things are not cited or stated, they are assumed to be non-existent and citing them makes them more real, more part of this organic and dy dynamic organization that we all feel very, very um, close to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm, at this point, I think we'll make uh, the minor changes that were suggested and bring it back for a a vote at the next meeting. I think that's the best thing to do. Continue to uh, think about yeah. it. Yeah. Changes yeah. that we, pardon me? Yeah, I just said, yeah. Okay. And um, really the only changes I see are um, changing it, the town of Amherst Council on Aging and um, and then adding a date and the date cannot be added until it's voted and adopted. So, okay, then moving on. Um, the next item on the agenda is, let me get my notes here. Uh, FLS is the um, nomination and election of officers. At the last meeting, we talked about board positions for the Council on Aging. And um, since that time, Greg Bascom and Tim, Timothy Neal have been reappointed by the town manager and their new terms will expire in June 30th, 2023. Town manager has not yet scheduled interviews for the position vacated by Richard Kuffler. 
So we are still one member short. I know the town manager has a few things on his agenda right now. And I think it'll be maybe at least another month before we can uh, look at filling that position. So at the meeting today, the positions for officers for FY21 need to be determined. Um, as we mentioned last week, Sue Dirks said that she would continue in the office of secretary. So now nominations are in order for the office of chair of the Council on Aging. Are there any nominations from the floor? Sue. Yeah, uh, I'd like to nominate Pat Rector for the chair, if she would be willing to accept it. I think she has um, uh, shown us a, a, a real heart with for the council and a vision and uh, certainly digging into work there. <laughs> Second the nomination. So Pat Rector has been nominated. Um, are there any further nominations? Okay, the nominations are closed. And Pat, do you accept that? I do accept it. Um, um, and um, I do want to say this, um, though, and I had a conversation uh, with Greg a little bit about this, that, that I think um, my hunger for our council is that we open up our processes a little bit um, um, in, this, in, in terms of how, um, in the, how we define our leadership, that we have some honest conversations. I'm really humbled by uh, the example, Rosemary's wonderful example and her diligence and, and uh, mm -hmm. her, her, um, and, and her values and her ethics that shine so brightly for us. So she's mm -hmm. been a really responsible and committed a leader and um, and I, I just I, I think uh, we need to ask ourselves what, you know how we can sort of um, we, um, trans and meet meet the really critical needs of our fellow seniors in our town um, at this time and um, I think we can raise our game. And uh, so, and that has to do with processes. Uh, I go back uh, to Mary Beth. The re one of the reasons that I decided that being with this council uh, was important to me was Mary Beth's question, which was, "Who's at the table and who's missing um, in in uh, policy making and power in our town among seniors?" And I'll just sit, state it as bluntly as that: power privilege and mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, who is missing. And so that's going to stretch us. And um, I think uh, that will mean that, you know, that, that'll mean some um, uh, us uh, digging deep in, in making and deepening our commitment to the work of this council. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, nominations are also in order for the Office of Vice Chair. Um, and are there any nominations from the floor? Pat. I would like to nominate Tim. <laughs> Second. And uh, Tim, um, you accept that nomination? Sure, I'd be happy to help out. Uh, yeah. Any other further nominations? When nominations for both positions are closed, and according to Robert's rule of order, we don't really need to vote if there's only one candidate for each position, but I think it'd be very nice to do so anyway. So all in favor of Pat Rector as chair of the Council on Aging, Tim Neal as vice chair and Sue Dirks as secretary. Please raise your hands in the affirmative. Aye, aye. <laughs> aye, aye. <clears throat> okay. Well, welcome to um, your new positions and the new leadership. And I'm very, very much looking forward to working 
um, with you, Pat, in this new way. And I think you bring a lot of good ideas and good qualities to the council. Thank you. Okay, and um, next in order is the um, approval of the minutes from our last meeting. It was wonderful to be able to see the minutes um, and the recording of the last meeting. And I think Sue somehow appreciated having it recorded in that way. So um, do I have a motion to accept the minutes? I move that we accept the minutes as presented. Thank you. And any second? I second. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hands in the affirmative. Aye, aye. And, aye. Yeah. It looks like the minutes are approved as stand. Thank you very much, Sue, for all of your good work. Thank you. <laughs> Um, now there are uh, topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Sue, did you have a question? Yeah, what about the friends? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. Um, Barbara, are you online? Do you want to talk about the friends or shall okay. I? Okay. No, I, I, thank you. I, if you can hear me, I'll talk about the friends. We're uh, continuously, continually getting um, donations, both by the census and by people just sending in money. Um, this is certainly um, delightful to know that people are wanting to help seniors in this way. Um, so I think uh, we're doing quite well considering the circumstances that is going on right and what's happening in our country right now. Um, I mentioned before, we have a new post office box and hopefully soon very few things will be coming to you, Mary Beth. Um, it's been interesting for me to know that we have gotten a donation, a lovely donation from uh, a family who member had passed away. And it's, uh, I don't know whether it was in their will or not, but it was certainly well, really appreciated. I, uh, we have not had a, our annual meeting. It's in our bylaws. The, if this is a possibility when things are, are um, when it's difficult to have a meeting. We have had uh, a lot of health issues within our board. And right now, um, we are just uh, contacting each other every once in a while to see if people are all right. Um, but our, um, I think one of the things that I would like is somehow to have a virtual tour of the new senior center at some point. Um, it's, I know there have been changes and I think it would be lovely maybe to have it uh, the media program maybe on our station, public station um, and to see what, it's, what has happened so that when the time comes to walk in, if that day comes, we have a an idea about what's going on. And I, I personally would like it. I know we're gonna have a newsletter coming out, so that might be something to be putting into the newsletter. I think I would like in the newsletter, the post office, the friends post office box change to make things easier. Um, and I, that is about what's happening here. Thank you very much. Barbara. Yeah. And I'd yeah. like to add one thing. Um, Etta was not able, she let me know that she wasn't able to attend this meeting, although she wanted to. 
she has some health issues and um, she wanted me to be sure and convey her love to all of her friends. Mm -hmm. So we miss her. Thanks, Tim. Um, I would uh, <clears throat> suggest, here's a suggestion for the uh, council and that is uh, that we have one of our board members be a liaison to the friends. And uh, I would like to suggest that for the moment, I become, <laughs> my whole background and career was in, in fundraising. I was a fundraiser at Amherst College. I'm quite familiar with all that. And I would be happy to uh, help with the Friends organization and just be more participative and understand. Uh, and whether there's a formality, there might be, I think it's helpful to have one of the board members be a uh, more active uh, liaison, if you will. Uh, at the moment, the two seem to coincide with my background, but not necessarily. Uh, but that's one suggestion. And Thank that's you. a wonderful suggestion, Tim. And um, yeah, we appreciate that very much. We historically have tried to have two council members be okay. uh, a liaison, be, but um, that that's perfect. Sue is also a member of the Friends. Oh, she is. That okay, great, Sue. Fills that out beautifully. Yeah. That would be very nice. Thank you. Yep. Um, <laughs> when we do have a virtual meeting <laughs> or uh, when we can get it together, we will let you know, Tim. Oh, perfect. That's um, great. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. That's good to know. Yep. Okay. Um, and then we can move on to any topics not anticipated for previously. Pat, you had something to say? I did. Um, I wanted to just bring this to uh, the attention of the, co the council. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, a long time um, uh, 50 year, uh, a, a person who has lived in town for 50 years. And um, there's, uh, she, uh, the topic was, what's gonna happen to seniors when the, when the students come back? Um, and um, I think, I know, I mean, I'm aware as you may, the rest of you may be that um, Paul, Bockelman has, our town manager has uh, raised some questions and issues to um, the university on that subject. But I think it would, could, might well be appropriate for us as a council to, uh, to draft our own comments uh, to, um, you know, I, I guess part of me wants to almost, I don't, almost want to, uh, offer that uh, in the form of um, a, a letter from the council in the student publication from us to them, the students directly, uh, um, uh, basically just uh, underscoring um, our, first of all, our welcome back <laughs> to our fair town <laughs> and, um, and that you know, um, so as a positive message, but also to just underscore uh, that many of us who are also, uh, you know, uh, have underlying health conditions, we are the grandmas and the grandpas in, <laughs> in uh, our town and, and that uh, we, the decisions that they ma um, make to wear masks and to socially distance and um, and be respectful of the of uh, everyone else. Uh, make a, an enormous, a critically em enormous difference to us in in preventing um, our <laughs> an untimely death <laughs> or severe uh, illness. So um, that I, I'm thinking that that's on the minds of a lot of uh, a lot of us and. Um, that we are uniquely positioned to craft something like that, uh, a statement like that, which I'm willing to do with, some, with any input from any of you who have some ideas about that, um, that, um, you know, so we don't have to have another meeting, but I could cer certainly circulate the draft around to everyone by, by email. And if it sounds good, we'll figure out how we can 
um, get it to students. What, what do you think? Yeah. As uh, Sue. Yes. Uh, it's been a great concerning topic at Green Leaves where heaps of seniors live. Uh, a, a real worry. And so I think that would be an excellent thing to do. Thank you for thinking of it. Yes, I agree. I, I think um, I'd be happy to work with you on a letter, but you go ahead and do, and devise a draft and, and we'll go from there. Um, there was a petition going around uh, a couple weeks ago that I'll see if I can dig up about um, students coming back. And I did so appreciate um, Paul Bachelman's, uh proposal to the chancellor and he had four major issues. I'll scan that and send that around to people as well because it was really very meaningful and concerning. So, Tim. The uh, only other suggestion I would make is don't forget the other two colleges in town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When we send that out. And the other thought is perhaps to uh, the superintendent of schools. Mm. So, high school students and, and others, I mean, they're not, quote, coming back, but sure. in terms of responsibility of young people for uh, responsible action is possibly a, a help. It also gets, frankly, the uh, little marketing for the council aid and aging yeah, That's true. Well. So they put us in the face of the public. Yeah, I mean, what the heck? That, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. Okay. And and I, and I just I just would echo uh, much like Sue's remarks. Uh, we receive a number of phone calls, and it is a frequent topic of conversation at lunchtime pickup, grab and go. Uh, the number of individuals who have expressed concern around this. So I just wanted to add to the echo of the voices to that, just to, to share what we've heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it could also be a letter to the editor, which once again from the Council on Aging puts us in the face of the public. I like it, that sounds good. So, uh, and are there any announcements to be made? No, okay. No, well, you know, the one thing I, I um, that I would share is uh, about voting. So I know um, there's, I actually have a column uh, for the, in the next, in this newsletter that's getting printed from the town clerk, Shavina Martin, about the um, accommodations uh, and hopeful uh, ways in which seniors can safely cast their votes. And that, that with the new legislation, every person who is already a registered voter will have the opportunity you will be receiving uh, the request for a ballot to be sent in that you can mail to the town clerk ahead of time and you can engage in, in early voting. Um, and I just, I think that that will be a topic that, that would be helpful for the COA to partner and make sure folks are made aware and continue to be aware. They'll be setting up uh, outside of the bank center for a week in August. Um, so we, and they will be here even over the weekend. So I think it's seven days that they will be present here on site and hope Hopefully that will ensure um, a safe participation, particularly for our older adults. Mm -hmm. so, more to come. Excellent. Okay, great. Okay, and I would suggest that the next Council on Aging meeting, uh, since we generally have not met in August, unless people feel the need to do so, would be September 3rd or September 10th. Uh, Labor Day is December, September 7th, if that makes any difference to people. Any comments about when? I, I not, I'm not a member, but I, there's a possibility I will not be here September 3rd, given that I have three children who are going to be uh, relocating at that time. Mm -hmm. The 10th, uh, I'll be back. It does matter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So the next meeting should be September 10th. Greg, this is his phrase. Greg, did you have something to say? You did. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I mean, things are so different this summer. 
uh, I remember that, you know, uh, for the last few years, you know, I've been in town for like 40 years now, and every summer people go away. That's not happening this summer. And ah. there's going to be a lot happening in September in terms of the change of the demographics in town and that sort of thing. And if everybody's, if most people are going to be here anyways uh, next month, and since I'm new, just getting, c catching up to speed, uh, I would suggest having a meeting in, in, in August. Uh, that way, if somebody's not going to be here, in is not available in September because it's going to be really busy. Uh, we still, you know, catch up with all the changes that are happening, and I think most of it's going to start in August in terms of getting ready for September. It's a very good point, and actually, I had considered that myself because you're right. There is a lot going on, and with the change in leadership, that also is a a way to ease in before things really get very much busier so yeah um what is the um date and let me get my calendar in august that might be best so the first thursday is august 6. uh-huh is that how does that sound to people uh let's go with that august 6 nine o'clock sounds good and we'll let um I'll check it out with Angela and um, she can reserve that date for us. So. Hey. Sounds hey. good. Thank you all so much for a good meeting. And um, I ask if someone wants to make a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Okay. Thanks. And um, meeting is adjourned at five minutes to 11. Good. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. everybody. Bye. Be well. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. Yeah. Be well. Thank you. Thanks.